This morning, the scripture comes from Galatians chapter 5. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. This is the word of God. Uh, today's um, sermon title is Constraint for Freedom. Um, sounds counterintuitive, but it is a true, and it's a very simple message today. Um, someone asked me, how do you know if someone is saved? Uh, short answer is, nobody can tell except God. But there are some signs that kind of indicate that this person has um, true personal relationship with God. Uh, and that is, you know, the passage that we read today, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there's no law. And, and this is what it is, you know. Uh, if you are a true child of God, that you'll have these qualities. In fact, these are not the fruits, the plural of the Spirit. It is fruit of the Holy Spirit. It is a multifaceted, you know, glory of, of a person who has a relationship with God. And uh, in fact, to that I'll add, if I may, add freedom. Those who have real relationship with God are truly free indeed and ability to receive love and to love. And you'll be surprised how many people cannot receive love. They, they'll, you know, they'll love and serve and all that, but they're unable sometimes because of other issues in their life. Sometimes they're just plain arrogant. They don't know that, but that's why some of that. And then, and then restfulness. People who are at peace, no matter what they go through, uh, whatever circumstances are, they're, they're um, I guess the base point is peace. And that, those are some of the signs. And those who are not saved, basically is what we read in the front part, and this is all these things, immorality, impurity, and all that. And in fact, I want to I wanna make this very clear to you. This is not something that you commit once and then you lost your salvation. That's not what you're talking about. If you continually walk in that path. In other, in other words, your lifestyle is, is, you know, can be described in this way, then you don't know God. In fact, it says they will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's simple. And no matter what you confess, no matter what you profess, and yet your life is characterized by these qualities and you continue in that, then you are not. You don't know God and all. You know, last weekend I was at the um, New York and Philadelphia and uh, had the privilege of ordaining a couple of pastors, one in New York and one in Philadelphia. And, and uh, you know, it's, I really enjoy that. I, good to see these young pastors coming up and, you know, taking ministry very seriously and all that. And... Um, you know, I arrived um, Friday night um, in Manhattan, and they put me in a hotel nearby church. And I know it's not a cheap hotel because, you know, anything in Manhattan is north of $300 a night, right? And it's one of those hotels that, oh, my gosh, if it had been somewhere else, this would be a condemned building here. And so it's a small room, and... Uh, and they, they have the heating unit or cooling unit in, in the wall, and they installed it so poorly, it has gaps all around it, right? And so you can hear the noise. I, I was on the fifth floor. I can hear the noise from ground floor. You know, they're arguing and fighting. And, you know, the garbage trucks all night and, the, you know, ambulances and all that kind of stuff. Well, I, I didn't sleep, right? 
uh, and I came down for breakfast, it's already gone. It's just a little bit and it's just all the crumbs left. It's not a good start. I was like, and then I, I'm walking to the thing and the noise and the, all that, the people fighting for parking and, and all that kind of stuff. By the time I got to that church, I, already, I was already upset. <laughs> and, and then I was hoping to get some decent pastry. They said, we'll have breakfast. For, if you don't have it in the hotel, don't worry, we have it. Got there. It's sad. <laughs> so I turned to the pastor and say, yo, you don't have to live like this. <laughs> you know? And that's my message today. You don't have to live like this. Because I know many people come to church. I'm telling you, you don't have to live like this. Because they don't get the full benefit of what Christ has, has done on that cross. Conceptually, they think they do. But the quality of their life is bound by the world. They are not free. They're in chains. Their character, their anger, frustration, fear, worry, jealousy, lust, addiction, you know, arrogance, and all those things prohibit them from experiencing what Christ shed blood to set us free for. This is a serious matter. It's not something that, well, I wish, you know, all that. No, Jesus has promised, promised us abundant life. Now, abundant life is not just having enough things and not worrying about. No, that's not. The abundant life is regardless of what you go through, there's a baseline of joy and deep contentment and significance, meaningfulness in life. That's filled with hope. It's not, it's not because you have just happy marriage and, and your kids are doing well and, and you have a pretty decent job. It's got nothing to do with that. Externals cannot influence in, in, internal peace. This is why the Bible says, if Jesus says, the peace I give it to you, the world cannot understand, cannot manufacture, cannot give it to you. This peace is out of this world. And this peace will set you free. And yet, many in church have absolutely no idea what we're talking about. They come in and out like they're going to concert and out. Nothing changed. There's no tangible difference in the way they live, they feel, they understand and their relationship with God. That is tragedy. That's what I'm trying to say. So right now, look at your neighbor and say, you don't have to live like this. <laughs> all right? We mean that. All right, mean that. So what's the secret? What's the secret? If you don't want to be bound by the world, its values and, and whatever trap it has for you, if you want to be free from it, what's the remedy? What's the answer? Very simple. You must live a life that's constrained by the biblical truth, Bible, the Word of God, to restrain yourself from the ways of the world if you really want to be free. Right? Freedom comes from constraint. That's what I want you to say. Uh, understand. This is very simple. In fact, today's sermon is short. Praise the Lord. <laughs> All right? So, if you get this, if you get this, you're done. You can go home now. <laughs> right? So, what is this? Living a life constrained by the Word of God. Not whatever fad that goes around in the world. Whatever media pumps out or whatever politicians pray, you know, promise and whatever else but the Word of God. And that dictates what is true, what is eternal, versus what is 
lie and what is temporal. Whatever that binds you and robs you of your freedom versus what sets you free indeed, not only this life, but life to come. It's a serious business. But there are so many people who feel like they're entitled to make their own decision. Brothers and sisters, God has given us his word. Bible says the word became flesh. That's Jesus Christ. And when Jesus finished his work and resurrected and ascended, promised to come back, his deeds and his words become word again. That's a scripture. And this word has to constrain our life. You don't have a relaxed relationship with word. You know, there, there's a, a speaker, uh, I was in a conference, and he came late. And he says, the reason that I'm late is because my wife has a relaxed relationship with time. <laughs> uh, and he was waiting and waiting, and she came late. That's what he, what he meant. But as some people have a relaxed relationship with the word of God. You can't. Because if you have a relaxed relationship with the word of God, then you are bound by the world. The enemy will not leave you alone. In fact, um, the word, the, the proverb, the, the wisdom book, the proverb is filled with restraints, right? Don't go to prostitutes, right? Don't, don't have inappropriate sexual life. Don't be greedy. Don't be arrogant. Don't be lazy. Don't lie. You don't live life the way, whatever you want, you want to you know, do all that. Have a boundary and restrain yourself in it. Why? Because by the word of God, you are to live his truth. Not immediate uh, benefit and doing this and that and that. We don't. We don't measure life because of the utility. Well, this guy's smart and has a good job. No, if this guy's handicapped and he cannot do anything, there's no value. No, it's a sanctity of life. This baby is inconvenient. I can't just get rid of it. No, you can't. See, all these things, the world is telling you, you have the right. You have a right to choose your gender. You don't. There's no re reassignment of gender. Gender is assigned by God, the creator. And, and how dare you go around and say you can do that. And that's a lie. That, that is not only a lie, biblically. It betrays human collective wisdom of thousands of years. There's no impact study done. There's nothing like that. But the whole world, I mean the United States especially, is doing that. And people still running on the platform of having unlimited abortion of, uh, until, until first breath. That's a ridiculous. Only country that does that is North Korea and not even China. China, the husband's permission has to be there to have abortion. United States is doing weird things that the whole world has not witnessed before. And yet, we are so proud that we are cutting edge of something. See, those kind of things. We are constrained by the scripture, the creator of life, the sanctity and value of life is his. He is the alpha and the omega. He's a beginner, he's an ender, he's a judge. We have to stand before him after this is done. And how dare, even in church, they try to redefine what life and what, what is not. That's ridiculous. Our life, brothers and sisters, has to be constrained by the scripture. This is a proper way of doing this, and this is not, and it's defined, and follow that. No matter what the world says, that's what brings us true freedom, right? Now, Bible talks about promises and ways of freedom. It says, if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Son, Son of God, Jesus Christ. He is the one who sets us free. By what? His cross, his death and resurrection sets us free. 
It's not just conceptual theological understanding of sin and forgiveness. It's beyond that. The quality of life here and the life after, all that is promised by God. And he says, you will be free indeed. But there are people still bound by anger, frustration, fear, worries, you know, and all that jealousy and all that kind of stuff. Brothers and sisters, Christ died for us that we will be free, right? And that, he said this, you will know the truth, and truth will make you free. Who said this? Jesus. My words, Jesus saying, is the truth. And how do we know? He says, I am the way, the truth, and life, and no one goes to Father but through me. He said that. He defined himself as a truth. He's a creator, and he set the boundary. And anything that goes up against and opposing his truth is false. And because of this, our life has to be confound, constrained by the scripture. That means we have to study and know the scripture and align our life within that place. This math department of University of Oregon put this out because I'm going to use the word constraint and restraint. So this defines it somewhat. The seminal difference between the constraint and restraint is that constraint is an absolute restriction imposed on the calculation, while a restraint is an energetic bias that tends to force the calculation toward certain restriction. You don't have to know. But what I'm saying is, Constraint is an absolute. That's what I'm trying to say. It's not up to you when, when you feel like. You know, when I was um, uh, visiting um, China a long time ago, and, uh, and um, I was um, you know, doing a little bit of marriage counseling and, and all that. And um, I, I was talking about submission, and uh, this, this uh, Chinese lady said, what if you don't agree? I told her, submission doesn't even begin until you disagree. Well, you do what you agree. That, well, what is the submission for? You agree. You're on the same page. That doesn't mean husband is absolute. That's not what I'm saying. After you negotiate, talk it out, discuss, and all that, you are in pass. What do you do as a couple? Submit, right? And submission is prerequisite is you don't agree, right? And you lower yourself to that. The word of God, what that means is when you are constrained by the word of God and those words that you don't like, you don't agree, that you submit to that word, that's how you are constrained by the word. Hello? Hello? It's not picking and choosing what you like and, and the leaving things that you don't like. It's not that. Word of God, you don't pick and choose. You know why you pick and choose? Because there are some things in the world that you cannot let go. Because your life is filled with the cheap substitutes. And because of that, you cannot let go. There's a lure of cheap substitutes. Whether you are, either you are bound by the word of God and enjoy the freedom or you are lured by cheap substitute and bound by the world. The people who are not constrained by truth or facts are easy prey for deception and destruction of the enemy who will put its victim in bondage, robbing of their freedom, true joy, and purpose. That's what it is. We take marriage very seriously. Unhappy marriage is really, really terrible thing. It's a living hell. We know that. But we don't easily cut it up and walk away. Because it's a covenant before God. It's very painful. But we suffer because we are constrained by the word of God. There are some cases 
the other spouse just walks away. You can't help it. There are many things in our life as a follower of Jesus Christ. We are constrained from uh, by the word of God that we cannot choose as easily as the world does. There is a way sometimes it's easy to lie in your job. Easy to blame other people for the fall and to get the promotion or take credit from other people's work and all that kind of ethical things and all that. We don't. We don't just take a job and that is just easy if it doesn't glorify God. This is why I say to you, some of your parents heard me again and again, your children's extracurricular activity possibly position your child for better school. That is not as important as your child consistently attend the groups here and grow in their faith. And that will serve them rest of their lives. If you compromise and cut through and all that, and your child may have better chance of getting to better school, some Ivy League or something, are influenced by the world and it doesn't, he, he or she doesn't have faith, and they're gonna make wrong choices. They're gonna live life that's disglo- it's not glorifying God. And may, in fact, they may live as the sons and daughters of the devil rather than of God, and you are responsible for it. It's a serious business. Constrained by the word of God, is a, is a better school more important than your child living a life of faith that glorifies God? You have to make that choice. As simple as that. I had a friend, very smart friend in MIT. He was a group from MIT. And second year, there was a church planter came to me and said, I want you to help me planting a church 40 miles from Boston. And uh, that means you have to go out there Wednesday night with me, and Sunday all day is gone. He was a pre-med, and he calculated himself, a very smart man, he calculated, okay, this means I have this amount of time. This means I probably will not do as, mu- uh, as well as I would, and therefore, but I'll make this choice. That's what he said, right? Well, he still came to UCLA Medical School, maybe not to his liking, but, you know. And he got the grant from the uh, government. He did study on the immu- you know, immunity and spirituality and all that kind of stuff. And, and that's another story. But what I'm saying to you is he made a calculated and deliberate choice that he may not go to school that he might want to, but he will take that. Because the opportunity to serve God is that important to him. I'll tell you another story. There was another, another lady in New York, a uh, remnant church back then. She's from another church from Maryland, from Johns Hopkins. And she was one of the powerful lawyers before age 40. And she was changing her job. And the job interview, she said, wherever I'm in the world, because she travels a lot, you know, you know corporate and all that, Wherever I'm in the world, by Saturday night, I have to be back in Manhattan because I need to go to church. That's a condition. And if you cannot provide that, I will not take a job. Well, because she's, you know, such in demand, of course, they gave her a job and things like that. And they asked. And this guy, I mean, she didn't share that. And the company actually called the pastor of the church and saying, and they're like curious, what kind of cult is this? You know, and they're asking questions this way and that way, and uh, what kind of denomination you belong, you know, all that kind of stuff, uh, and trying to find out. And, and, and she answered her boss later on after she got the job, because of believing is not enough. I need to belong to a community of believers, and this is my community. And wherever in the world, whether I'm in Saudi Arabia or, or in the Philippines or Tokyo, I need to be back by Saturday night. And if I need to be there two, three weeks, 
I have to come back every week, weekend, and go back. And I put up with that. That's the condition. The life that is committed to God and constrained by the word of God, it gives true freedom in that person. Now, I would like to show you this. I was not say it, but I you can find all kinds of things in YouTube these days. I saw how I find this. It's the hunting monkeys. We're going to play. Um, you don't have to read all that. It's kind of weird font anyway. So I want to explain to you. This is indigenous people in colonial times, and um, these uh, you know, people are impressed by that. Um, they're hunting monkeys, and these monkeys are so fast, you know, so with the arrows and all that, it's not really effective. So what they did uh, is to um, put some wild rice in the, in, in the bottle jar with a very small mouth, mouth of the jar, and the monkey barely slides a hand in there, and once it grabs uh, the wild rice, and once it makes a fist, it cannot pull it out, right? And nobody's, you know, binding it, only his greed. And it will not let go, right? It cannot let go, as the animal instinct is, it cannot let go of that fistful of rice. And then the hunters will come slowly, like these, and they'll just capture it. All right, that's enough. All right. What is this fistful, fistful of wild rice are you holding on to that's causing you to be captured by the enemy and become his prey? That's the question. Some of you have different values, beliefs. We had the one lady who believed that she had to send her kids to private school or home school. Nothing's wrong with that, but it becomes overriding value against everything, including scripture demands. Then you're setting yourself up to be trapped, ensnared by that fistful of wild rice and destroy your life. Some people have hobbies as the most important value in their life. Some people have a lifestyle. You gotta have a certain zip code. And some people have, your kids have to do this and you have to appear like this and all that kind of things. Brothers and sisters, we are hemmed in and, and conditioned by the world. And we are satisfied, we are we trying to satisfy ourselves with the cheap substitutes that cannot give us real joy or freedom. But real joy and freedom, and much more than that meaningfulness, comes from the life that is constrained by the word of God. Isn't that incredible? This is counter intuitive, paradoxical, as the philosophers want to say. When you're bound by something, it gives you true freedom. When you think you are bound by nothing, free from the word of God, free from God, living life as though God doesn't exist, what is that? A sin. And you think you're free. No, you are not. You're bound by jealousy, envy, you know, all other stuff that comes with it. And when you continue that life, and you'll be entrapped, and there's no way out. That's what you call death. So why do people get into this? It's undisciplined life, laziness, misguided self-love. You see, um, if you get up early in the morning, put your sneakers on, you go and run, uh, and, and before you go to work and you know, have a healthy food like yogurt or whatever else. That's self-love, isn't it? It's self-love. 
But if you lie in your couch and stuffing yourself with the potato chips and playing this with a StarCraft or whatever game for three o'clock in the morning and miss the morning service, what is that? That's self-love too. Gives you joy, you know, pleasure. One is stupid self-love. One is smart self-love. Right? Both of them give you comfort or some, uh, something, but one destroys you, one builds you up. And the laziness, the undisciplined life, is life is unhinged or decoupled from biblical values. Feeling like you're truly free. You can do whatever. And there was a, there's some couple of guys that said in, a, in, in, in the ministry, and they rather drink heavily. And, and they said, hey, you shouldn't be drinking, you know, as, especially as a Christian leader and, and all that. Some people do, but I'm saying to these guys close enough, I'm telling. And he says, hey, we are free, you know. This is the liberty in, in our faith. So I told him, no alcoholics are free. They're not free. They don't drink because they're free. They have to drink. That's not freedom. Life that is constrained by the word frees people from the bondages of cheap substitutes with true significance and lasting happiness. I don't know what holds you back. I don't know what your wild rice is. But you have to let that go. And if you don't let that go, you're ensnared by your own greed, own arrogance. You know, we are living not in the time of lack or in the hopelessness, but of abundance. Infinite possibilities. There are more people educated than uneducated in present time, more so than any other time in human history. But we have more people suffering from mental diseases, hopelessness, addiction, suicidal things. And all that. Why is that? Because we thought we are so smart. We can chart our own ways. If we can do that, God would not have given us his word. We can figure it out. But God has given us his word so that we may follow it. We may live it accordingly. It's like Olymp Olympic athlete. Olympic athlete, you know, like... You, you see them like figure skating, twirling around, gymnast, swimmers and divers, tracks and all that. Things that we cannot even imagine achieving it. They have such freedom, such, you know, um, performances that we can't even think about. That doesn't come free. Olympic athletes, they cannot eat whatever they want to eat. They cannot sleep whenever they want to sleep. They cannot have a social activities Whatever they want to do, they have a very confined lifestyle. That discipline, that affords them the freedom on the ice or water or track field and whatever else. Spiritually, same thing. If we don't have mindset that is constrained by the scripture and you're loyal to submit to that scripture rather than things of the world, then you can perform. And when you perform, you're going to have a freedom like never before. That's what it is. Don't have a relaxed relationship with the word of God. And you do whatever is convenient, whatever is expedient, whenever you want to pick it up, and that kind of things. That is not lordship of Jesus Christ. Lordship of Jesus Christ means he has an absolute constraint over your life. That's what it means. That's why many are not free 
because they are not constrained by the Lord. Second is, I'm going to talk, you know, preach about addiction and, and all that some other time. I'm just, you know, going to just skim through it. Addiction basically is manifestation of hopelessness. It's a cheap relief. I remember one time I was ministering in, in downtown LA, Skid Row, and, and one of the homeless <coughs> folks I was ministering to, I, I got to talk. Very articulate fe fellow, and uh, you know, he looked a little different, and we talked. And I don't know whether to believe him now and whatever, but he said he used to be a, a lawyer in Beverly Hills and a pretty good life. Right? As I, I had a happy family, good job. You know, whatever have you, I have all the toys. So I said, what happened to you? One word, hopelessness. I don't know why. He said, all of a sudden, this is it? And he got into cocaine. And he lost his family. He lost his practice. He lost everything. Ended up in the skid row. So what caused you? And he said, cocaine is not the problem. It was hopelessness got me here. Cocaine was a cheap, convenient relief. My real problem is I have nothing to live for. He found that out too late. It breaks my heart some believers are hopeless. They have nothing to live for, nothing to die for. Because their faith is only to help them to live a little more convenient life, a little bit more comfort. That's not what Jesus died for us. He died so that you may be free, that we have an abundant life. He promised that. You need to fight for that. That's your right. And that comes through a life that's constrained by the word of God. Let me just briefly go through this. Addiction is a cycle, no matter what it is, whether it be substance, behavior, relational, whatever it is. There's a triggering event, something that triggers that habit. And then you have habitual things. It gives you relief, cheap you know, uh, temporal relief. And then it goes back to the same void of the emptiness, regret, and hating your life. And going that. And then some event will trigger again. And then you just like the animal there, trapped in, in, that, in the cage, you go through the same thing. And by the time you come through the cycle once again, you feel worthless and more that, whether it be gambling, whether it be alcohol, whether it be uh, sexual, whether it be other things, even, even workaholics, the relationships and all that, that, that same thing go through. Do you think they are free? No, they are not free. We know that. Some people use faith like this addicts. Right? Some calamity come and become religious for a while, and you get some kind of relief, and people love you and all that. And then, and then after things get better, and then you just walk away. Hey, you know, I have, I have a life to live after all. And you walk out there, and you go through the same thing. Another calamity hits, you come and become religious and all that. That is not real having relationship with God. You're, you're just using religion as a consumer, as an addict. The shot in the arm. That's not faith, brothers and sisters. But people do. Church filled with those kind of people is not a church. That's why many are not free. That's why I'm saying, you don't have to live like that. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, bled, died to set us, not only deliver us from sin to forgiveness, that's basic. But you'll, you, you know, in, in, in encounter divine exchange, a lot more than that. 
enough for each and every one of us to live an abundant life that he has promised. It's, it's tragedy that what he has accomplished is being used so little by small group of people. This is for everyone. This is for everyone to enjoy and to um, experience. Right. Let, me, let me just go quickly here. Third is, why are we not constrained by the word? Because we are bound by a lie. And, and this is the one I, I'm really serious about because uh, look like every day uh, through media and all that, there's a lies are being pumped out everywhere and all that. Um, I, I speak in some other time. Socialism, brothers and sisters, is not, it's not, not only inconsistent with the scripture, uh, it is opposite to that. In fact, FDR knew about this. And he says, the communists hate us because democracy, he says, democracy is basically Christianity. And, and there are a whole bunch of people uh, in our political system, they're pushing for this kind of things and, and saying equity and equality. And you know how empty those things are turning out to be. All kind of falses and lies and corruption and all that kind of things. It's the same thing in China, same thing in Russia. I've seen that firsthand. And those things that the young people are being sold to all the time. And this lie, brothers and sisters, the worst book that ever written is by Karl Marx, is Das Kapital, The Capital, and The Communist Manifesto. That literally killed hundreds of millions of people and more hundreds of millions of people in misery in the last century. It's not, it hasn't even been 100 years, and we are revisiting that in the United States of all the places. And that, so when you walk away from the scripture, you are bound by the lies of the world. And that's what's happening exactly. Why? Because of arrogance. We know better than the Bible, the Word of God. That's what it is. I remember there was a young lady uh, when I was in college, and um, try, people trying to witness to her and all that. And, and she's so arrogant. You just, you know, uh, rebuff them and, and, and all that kind of stuff. And third year or something, she disappeared. And we were saying, hey, what happened to her? And all that. Later on, we found that she joined the cult. This is supposed to be very smart and you know, taking care of herself. And she joined the cult, gave everything to the cult, ending up marrying the person that she, she had never met before. The dumbest choice. Why? Because arrogance is a blinding thing that caused you to be destroyed. It's a false freedom. The false freedom ties a millstone around our neck so that we would sink to the bottom of the lake so that we may perish in deception. Basically what it is. I'm going to talk about arrogance some other time. Arrogance is a worse sin. You know why? Because Satan's sin is arrogance. And arrogance prevents you from getting real help. Arrogance stops you from becoming a person that God has designed. Arrogance is the worst poison, poisonous pill you can, you can swallow. You can be destroyed by arrogance. And if you, if you know anything about Karl Marx's life, and that's what it was. And um, I'll talk about it when I have chances later on. So what is the remedy here? You know, uh, you know, stay away from the cheap substitutes, false promises, and all that, all the trappings. And to be free, what is, what is the uh, true? The life bound by the word of God. 
Life constrained by the word of God is not just going through the list of don'ts, do's and don'ts, don'ts, but life constrained by the word and the spirit of God actually pursues after the most excellent and worthy goals in life, enriching our lives with joy and contentment. It is that good. Life that is constrained by the word of God, all the promises of God are fulfilled in them. That's what it is. And why don't we believe that? Because we have arrogance, thinking we can choose better. We have a one foot here and one foot there, and we can get the, uh, you know, from the bo both world. It's not, it's not possible. You need to be completely sold on to this. And David's psalm, one of the, uh, my favorite uh, psalm, it says, my boundary lines have fallen in pleasant places. I love that expression. He says he's been walking with God all his life, and he found himself in a, in a pleasant place, and God has put a boundary around him. Is it is it once or twice? No, his lifestyle propelled him to be in that place. And while you follow him day in, day out, and day in, day out, you are there. And all of a sudden, you find yourself, and like, wow, thank you, Lord. That's what it is. And, and the life that is constrained by the word of God forces us to do things in a proper way. You know, we think we love. You know, one of the things that we, we ask our, uh, you know, those who join us from uh, other churches and whatnot uh, is that, when you first come, uh, please uh, don't do anything. Um, just receive. Receive first. Right? Take a rest and receive. That's very important. Don't come and just serve. Right? That's, that's not. Because our faith starts from rest. You know, other, other religions say, you work hard and you, you do that and that you are good enough, then you can rest. No, our, our faith starts from rest, receiving from the Lord. And when you receive, then you can give. Don't give out of empty tank. Because when you're trying to do it, because your love confined by the world is distorted. And that love Seem like you're doing something, but at the end, it's not going to help. Isn't that right? As parents, we try to love our kids, but when we love our kids with our own brokenness, what, what do we become? We become helicopter parents, smothering parents, trying to insulate our kids from every appropriate sufferings. And at, at the end, what do we make? We make spoiled brats. Kids without any initiatives. Kids with a, a whole bunch of entitlement, as if life supposed to serve them. That's the product we, we create. And that's wrong. So, see, love of God, when it's properly given, you build that person up, that person becomes interdependent with you. Uh, that's the word they use, that we appreciate each other, but we are not depending on one another. But if you love with a worldly love, what happens? The one who receives love becomes dependent on you. Every time they have a problem, they call and they come and they expect something from you. That's not biblical love. Uh, some people who have a codependency problem will think, wow, I'm gratified because I have, you know, they, they have need of me. That's sickness. Isn't that right? Biblical love makes you strong and be able to stand. And they don't, they don't call after you. They don't seek after you every time they have a problem. That's the fruit, the bitter fruit of worldly love. But we think that's, that's love. That's why the word of God has constrained our behavior, even understanding of love, even understanding of, of service, and all those things has refined 
by the renewing of our mind that we know what is excellent and good will of God is. Without renewing of our mind by the scripture, we can't. And that's why we end up pursuing, uh, you know, when you, when you, uh, our life is constrained by the word of God, we pursue excellence. This is why Philippians chapter 4, it says, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of a good repute, if there is any excellence and any, anything worthy of praise, dwell, live, abide on these things. Right? That's, that's the end point of living life that's constrained by the word of God. Not compromising, not choosing whatever is convenient or expedient. That means you cannot say certain things. That means you cannot do certain things. Because the scripture guides you in that matter. That will lead you into true freedom and abundant life. Let me uh, finish with this. This is a love differential. And a lot of people, once they understand the gospel and understanding gospel and actually receiving and living gospel is a different thing. Right? It's knowing about God is not knowing God. Right? Knowing about God is not having relationship with God. It's conceptual understanding, but it has no power to change your life. You have to know God. You have to experience God. Right? And our, our faith, it begins with not from the goodness of your heart. So I, I, I know the truth, therefore I'll do this. Out of the goodness of my heart, my goodwill. That doesn't count. That's a fleshly product. God is not interested in that. The first thing that needs to happen is to be loved by God. You have to feel that love. You have to be overwhelmed and shocked, dislodged from your whatever is normal to you. That you have to, you have to be moved and shaken by the love of God. That, that love of God causes us to love God. No man or woman can love God on their own. It has to start from him. So if I can say, love of God initiates love of God. Love, God's love toward us initiates our love for God. That sets us free from all bondages and deception. Now that places us in the right place of submission to his word of God. Because we now trust him. Not with head, but with a heart. That's what it is. Christianity is very simple. You know, that's why Jewish people count the day from evening to the morning. That's the only country in the world. It's not morning to evening. No, evening. Why? Rest. Rest in the Lord first. And after the day of work is coming. That's what it is. Our Christian faith is receive his love. Be overwhelmed by it. Feel secure in his love. And confined by, uh, constrained by his word. Then now you're in a place to make real difference. Now you can give him the worship and honor that he will be glad to receive. That's what it is. But many people are not loved by God because they don't find them place in the place of receiving that love because they have something else the more important to them. That's why, you know, on a Friday night when we, when we come here and do that, I, you know, I... I'd like to give you as much time to pray. If it's up to me, I'll give you two hours flat and don't talk anything. You know why? Because prayer doesn't happen because you go through grocery lists or, or you speak in tongue. Prayer happens, you know, because when you don't know how to pray, you pray all the things, you know, bless all the missionaries in the world and all that. It's only two minutes past. <laughs> that's, that's normal. See, you have to run out of words to pray before 
actual prayer begins. So your mind cannot concoct any more theological or whatever or, or your emotional need things to pray. Because a prayer is communication of not of your mind but your spirit. And your spirit, so you have run out of things that you can create within yourself and to be in that place of boredom, your thoughts coming, uh, coming back and fro, and you're trying to stay in the spiritual concentration. That's a muscle through which you can receive his word. So if you have not been bored and run out of things to say, you're always busy, somebody telling you what to do, and all that busy, 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 you haven't prayed. You made a whole bunch of noise. But when you come to that place, and Lord, I don't even know what to pray. This is not something that I can make it up. Speak to me. That's why the Bible says, be still. Know that I'm God, it says. Without that stillness, we cannot know. That's why. This, that needs to happen. It's just religious activities and, and sounds good. This is what everybody does. And that's not what it is. I want you to be really blessed. That's really part of my heart. I want you to have abundant life, true freedom, not hemmed in, not, not you know, squeezed in, not trapped or under bondage of any kind. What Christ has provided on the cross is truly yours, all in all. In order for that to happen, live a life constrained by the word of God. Don't choose, don't submit. Submit to the word of God. One of the things that I do daily for about 30, 90, almost 40 years is have a quiet time before the Lord. I don't compromise on them because they're my lifeline. I meditate on the word of God. I take journals. And that sustains me. No matter what I went through, that gives me peace. And that's what I want you to have in your life. You know, I, I want revival in our church, that people be just blessed, you know. I really want that because I want you to have a reference point of how vast, how powerful God's love is. To blow you, you know, blow you away. But that doesn't sustain. Even the most powerful revivals, they don't last more than five years. Where are you out? That is needed. We pray for it. And yet, something that's going to sustain all the way through your life, word of God anchored and constrained by the word of God, your lifestyle that constantly honors God, that's where you'll be blessed. And that's why, you know, uh, people going through difficult times, they have a hope in Christ because they live life in that. And hope does not disappoint because love of God has been poured out within our heart through the Holy Spirit who was given to us for while we are still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Our Heavenly Father sent His only Son. While we are helpless, while we are sinners, while we are unlovable, He died for us. So that not just be forgiven of sin, so that we have a right relationship with Him. Live a life that is abundant. Live life that is truly free. That's what it is done for. By this love of God was manifest in us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. Brothers and sisters, faith, what is, uh, what, what is Christian life? That we live life through Christ. That's what it is, Right? 
I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And this body, that I, I, this life I now live in this body, I live in the faith of Son of God who died for me. We live this life through him. And what is that? What is that avenue? What, what's the channel, that walls of that channel? That's word of God. Our life is constrained by the word of God. That's what it is. I have nothing more to say. So today, it's very simple, one-point sermon. Either you are bound by the world, world, or you are bound by the word of God. So you choose. And don't go back and forth. And stay with it. Amen? Why don't we bow our heads? And now, uh, if there's anyone here have not invited Jesus as their personal Savior, Son of God who died for us. And all these things mean nothing. You need to have that relationship with God. And, and how? Only inviting Jesus, your Savior and Lord in your life. Not relying on your righteousness or your good works, but only the work that he has finished on the cross. That's the only thing that works. So pray under breath and say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Savior and Lord. Help me to honor you and worship you all the days of my life. Send me your Holy Spirit that I may, I may live this life constrained by the Word of God for the true freedom and true abundance. God will answer that prayer. And those of us who pray that prayer, and yet we find our lives, we are living according to the drum beats of this world. You gotta do this, you gotta do that, and this is normal, this is not, and all that. Renounce those things, those noise in your head, and say, the word of God is word of life for me. And I live my life constrained by this word. Not by my insecurities and greed, my ambitions. But may the Lord be glorified in my life. And Lord, give me this abundant life. Pray that prayer. <laughs>